Good afternoon. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, yes, yesterday we waited a whole day to get on the plane and then we found out the windscreen wiper didn't work. So I'm very lucky to be here. And I've never been in Iceland before, so it's a great honour to be here. I'm sorry I'm only here for a few days. Um, I will try and be extremely prompt. So we have a lot to get through this afternoon. Um, and if I speak with a strange accent or too quickly because I've had lots of good Icelandic coffee today, <laughs> please interrupt me. And I am originally a New Zealander from a Danish town, from a, a lost prime minister. That explains the name. Um, so anyway, on, onwards with this talk. So I have been um, an academic for some years, and before that I worked in IT, and I've been involved on the edge of game design as an amateur for about oh, 40 years. Um, so I'm very fascinated by games, but I'm even more fascinated not just by the playing of games, but how people design them. I love watching people play games. I love watching people design games for other people. And I'm moving from my sort of more academic background towards how can we involve the public in the design of these games? Because I believe, having taught game design on and off for 20 odd years, that people actually learn more from designing them than from playing them, often. So um, I'll just briefly go through some projects, a few projects, and explain my particular interest, which is in cultural heritage, digital cultural heritage, and the 3D. Because I trained originally in architecture, but I have been corrupted by the humanities for some time. And I'm going to explain how I corrupt multimedia and IT students to do digital humanities, perhaps without realizing it. Um, I was for four years as well a UNESCO chair, which uh, might sound impressive, but really the university puts you forward, you get peers to vote you in, and then you spend four years on your own trying to work out how to do whatever the mission of your chair or your network is. And, uh, and and the, um, the advantage, though, is you get invited to Paris once every four years, where they will pay you lunch. <laughs> it's not quite so tempting in Australia, but it was still, it's still amazing to meet other UNESCO chairs. And you meet people, for example, who are in their towns, one third doesn't know about the heritage, one third does know about the heritage and doesn't want anything to remember it by, and one third who does. So the, the politics, the conflicts, and the social issues, I, I find fascinating. But I also find fascinating is how when I started my PhD, which was with, funded through Lonely Planet, in those days, uh, people wanted you to do virtual environments. This is around 20 odd years ago. But when you look at the most successful virtual environments, they tend to be simulations, military exercises, and games. Right? So I became very interested in why. And I, then I also worked for Daria and Dickham Lab. Well, my job was Dickham Lab, but I worked with EU Networks about 12 years ago. And it seemed to me we have a lot of repositories and scholars, and archives and so forth, but very little in the humanities and how we interact between us. And there was a scholar, was it a, a dean of a famous university, I won't name it, but she said in a meeting, it isn't it amazing as a humanities person, we now have a million books. And I, well, I agree, but um, I, I stupidly said, um, well, isn't it more important that we have a million readers instantaneously? So, so to me, one of the interesting things about humanities, it depends on your field, of course. I came from architecture and philosophy, but we weren't really designed to handle people in real time in, in, that, in that scale, but also in terms of how interactive and immersive it could be. And this is also related to tourism, because one in three or two out of three people when they tour are actually going to cultural heritage sites as well. So how can we link all of these things? Um, unfortunately, first I'm going to mention a couple of problems. And I'm going to talk briefly about the vanishing virtual and digital heritage. I'm going to talk briefly about the technology, but I'll, I'll be very brief about this. But uh, I will mention that there is a, a publication called The Conversation, which is in some English parts of the world where the academics write to the public. And in my case, down under in Australia, there were two people who wrote about virtual heritage. Uh, cult, VR applied to cultural heritage, we'll define it for now. And they, one was a philosopher who said, Virtuality cannot convey the real thing. And the other was an architect who said virtual reality architecture can't convey atmosphere. And they're mostly right, maybe, but I kind of disagree with them. And I think one of the most interesting things to me, particularly for a philosopher, is why are we trying to convey reality? 
couldn't be our convey process, which it's much more about, and how it could imply alternatives and simulations and way things could uh, combine for you to explore alternatives. So I was really quite concerned at that stage about how VR is perceived. Um, and there's, we have a, a parallel issue as well with the museums, and you all know about COVID, but it's beyond just COVID, and it's around the world. The number of people who don't visit, the number of people who don't know about collections, the amount of collections which you can't see. Um, and I'm going to give an example. And because I'm now based in Australia, I'm going to show you a Tibetan archive. That's a bit loud, sorry, I'm going to say. So this is a collection of an, um, ancient manuscripts. The sound is incidental, actually. But they don't know what's in it. So they have the physical artifacts, they don't have the money or the resources for most of these manuscripts, these amazing manuscripts. Just, just imagine what that museum is like, that archive. And in Australia we have the same problems. We have archives that are flooded, we have libraries that are facing environmental problems. How do we get people to approach these and understand these and connect these small bits of data, especially when they're digitalized? And my students think when you digitalize something, you've captured it and conveyed it and it's going to last forever. They don't think about the environmental cost of the digital. They don't think about the people who actually have to maintain it. And they don't know how to connect them unless they're told how to. So, yeah, goodbye Tibetan archive for a second. We have also another problem. Um, Fremantle Prison on the right had, was a World Heritage Site, still is. Had a million visitors a year and then none. And we talked to them about putting in mixed reality for ghost stories and escape stories and so forth. But as the museum pointed out, um, their, their main uh, feature is actually the human storytelling of the guides and the head who was uh, part of a large museum and involved with digital projects for years said they break down we can't train the staff we don't know how to upgrade them and then about two weeks ago I spoke to the South Australian Museum who had developed an escape room years ago and they mentioned one other thing I'd forgotten about they don't have time to even make sure the software is updated so for AR it's a big problem and I can tell you as well in Australia and perhaps also in Iceland, people don't download phone apps. So the last three to five years, museums have done wonderful apps on your phone, but for some reason, people don't want to download the applications. So there is all these issues. And in the end, we didn't work with the, uh, the prison, but they still have these problems of visitors and so forth, and these amazing, rich, immersive stories. And I was co-chair of the, the digital heritage theme of ECOMOS, which is the volunteer organization allied to UNESCO to help review heritage sites for world heritage status and so forth. And it was the first time digital heritage was part of ECOMOS. And I, I proposed it, and then years later they decided to have it, and I co-chaired it. And most of the papers were traditional academic papers. Here is a project. We did well. Let's walk away. And But one of the few takeaways I, I got from that, apart from the traditional academic circuit, was there was a beginning emerging interest amongst the academics and the institutes about how we combine fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, with care data, which is more about indigenous responsibility, ethics, and co-sharing. But how do we involve that with our digital heritage projects? And from about two decades of my experience of digital virtual heritage projects, and it goes beyond that, we have major issues in even finding these projects, let alone making sure people know how to use them and access them. Um, and I, I'm always using this slide. Uh, there's another slide which is even better than this, but I'll get in trouble showing it. So I'll, I'll talk about this one, which I find fascinating. And I mentioned this last year in the virtual conference, but it's, it's so impressive and daunting in a way. This is the most expensive online virtual heritage project I know of. Uh, IBM uh, collaborated with academics and researchers in China and America. It was $3 million US, I think. Um, they used a free uh, game called Talk by Garage Games. With the game company, they modified it to work online. It was like a, an earlier second life. You could be an avatar, you could teleport, etc. Within six months of being online, it disappeared, and I still don't know exactly why. So we have some very expensive white elephants um, which disappear. And so a scholar at, and I, a research fellow and I, actually went through some of the major conferences three years ago and tried to find the 3D assets 3D projects, the formats, etc. And if there's, and I would say these are one, two, three, four, five of the most important digital heritage conferences in the world, up until 2019 or so, if there's like 300 plus conference papers on 3D digital heritage, 
you're lucky to find 30 or 40 references to the 3D. But then if you try and play them, you're lucky to find more than one or two. So I call this the vanishing virtual, it's not my term. So the virtual heritage projects don't even last as long as the heritage projects. And if you look at the repositories as well, the features aren't designed for archaeologists, historians, and so forth. Um, and I spoke to a, the cultural heritage man at Sketchfab who's just lost his job recently. And he said, well, it is a presentation format. It's not a preservation format. So there's still a big gap between the 3D models, the public, and ongoing use and reuse. But I, I said I was going to be positive. And I, I, this is a 2015 project, not digital at all, uh, that Leeds and other partners ran. And it was about heritage decision making with your community. And they mentioned four themes at the end of this project, and you can read it online. Um, to act, connect, reflect, situate. And I thought, in yellow, there's a digital equivalent to this. So rather than VR as copying reality, VR can simulate reality or potential reality. You can use linked open data to connect across data and collections and viewpoints. And you can use digital technology, and in my case, mixed reality, to see things through other people's eyes. And mixed and augmented reality can also help you see the artifacts in the context of where they used to be or how they used to be used. So I think that um, there's still some wonderful ways we can use digital heritage, and then also particularly in the way in which we watch people share it and use it and make meaning from it themselves. And this is a very old project by one man, a volunteer in Brazil. It's apparently the most famous or important Brazilian church of its kind and it was, it was a major graffiti problem. So what he did was, and this is about 10 years ago, uh, Demetrius Lasset, he had made game engine levels of these churches, but he decided now to create software, very simple software, and teach people to make their own Google VR cardboard boxes. And he taught them how to create videos of the avatars guiding you around the church inside the panoramas of the church. And they weren't programmers, they weren't designers, but they all had cameras, so they could all make this hybrid video panorama system. And that's not the important thing. The important thing is the local community spent so much time making these video panorama guides, because nobody had um, the opportunity to make graffiti in the church. So I think this is where I would like to move with these academic projects. Um, and I'll just briefly mention my PhD, which is, I think, looking back, I'm very unusual, uh, very lucky. Excuse me for the fonts changing on this computer. Um, Learning Planet was the industry partner, and they discovered that they had a virtual tourist in 2000, 2001, people who wanted a book on Afghanistan that was being bombed, obviously not wanting to go there. So it was their most requested book. And so they said to my supervisors in engineering and architecture, we'd like to explore 3D online internet tourism. And I was allowed to choose the technology, the site, and the research questions. So of course I chose ancient Mexican world. Um, and the interesting thing, which I only discovered once I took on this heritage site was, one of the three archaeologists who cracked the Mayan code actually learned how to read it. had gone to Australia in my city. So I was able to talk to him about how we could use a very simple online world to give people an impression of an ancient 1,000-year-old site from the Mayan perspective themselves. Um, so it wasn't designed to be realistic. It was designed to be experiential. And it was designed to see what type of interaction helped them learn the most. And so it was really an evaluation of an evaluation. And I had seven different evaluation methods. But very briefly, I found that the people who performed the tasks the quickest, I usually had 3D or game experience, they remembered and understood the least. So they were focused the most on the game, not on the understanding. And when I showed 80 to 100 archaeology students the prototype, the major questions, and they were studying Mayan archaeology, the major questions were, how do I change clothes? And how do I find weapons? <laughs> And so I thought, well, this is really interesting. And I had these mini games at the end. So if you do tasks, you go to these mini games, which are based in Mayan myths. And because this archaeologist was so wonderful and said, yes, you can use portals, and yes, you can use invisible sky snakes, and so forth, um, they, and we had Mayan music, which led them through the world, um, I found that if I told them that they were games, people knew exactly what to do, but they didn't treasure what they were doing. If I told them they were digital archaeological simulations, they treasured what they were um, supposed to be doing, but they didn't know what to do. So games gave them this framework of navigation and interface. Um, but I also found that um, extrapolating cultural understanding was the most important thing to see what they learned. So not asking them subject questions about the site, 
but seeing if they could extrapolate their knowledge of the Mayans to others. And the final thing I might mention, not quite, two final things I might mention, um, one is in English language, challenge can mean two things. Uh, difficult and you don't want to do it, i.e. schoolwork, and difficult and you do want to do it, i.e. a game. So it occurred to me then, how can we combine this, this game-like mindset and this understanding of, a, of a, another past, another culture? Um, so I, I'm going to run out of time, so I won't go into the definitions too much. But one definition in the middle I might suggest is, um, if virtual heritage is VR applied to cultural heritage and it includes games and so forth, what is really important, perhaps, is conveying the cultural significance of that through the site. And in the last 20 years, I've changed it to, we need to convey the culturally significant presence. So I came up with this term, cultural presence. So if we built a recreation of another site, and you had avatars and you could go through it, and you understood other people were there, you have social presence. But if they were talking to you about the bus stop timetables in Reykjavik, and you were supposed to be an ancient Roman world, you don't actually have cultural presence. Does it make sense? So I tried to find a definition of culture different to social definitions. And one of the interesting things about culture, A, there's actually a book in the 52 definitions of culture in the English language, but B, culture is a, an object and a verb. And if we look at heritage sites, it's not just creating simulations of heritage sites, it's sharing the meaning of them and preserving the meaning of them. And if you look at virtual worlds of cultural heritage, there's almost never an explanation of care. And the person doesn't have to take on responsibility to the future. So, yeah, culture is a difficult, difficult sense. Um, but I, when I came up with this term, I noticed the archaeologists used it slightly differently, and there was a session at the Oxford one, which had to run the year after during the COVID. But they, in their session, said most of the VR, AR, XR experiences fall dramatically short of the goal of expressing the importance of past places and things to their original communities, which I agree with. And when I rewrote the book, which was based on my PhD, basically, I noticed that there were many of these issues that were still a problem. I'm just going to give you one, two suggestions. In evaluation, when we're an academic, we tend to evaluate a project, we write about it, we walk away. Why can't we build the evaluation into the project and the audience understands what we've learned? That's one. And secondly, designing a game or a virtual environment and maybe the game designers disagree with me, but especially in VR, designing it without thinking about navigation is a disaster. Because as soon as you put people in a digital environment, they lose all these cues they take for granted in the real world. And, and we have this related term, which is digital literacy, which I often try and talk about digital fluency. So being able to read things and use, use tools is fine, but you need to have fluency across them to make your own meaningful advances. But in a virtual environment, we don't have any definition which talks about the issue of navigating and understanding how other people navigate. So when you talk to, to the game designers who developed the first headset VR, and they used the sunny rules and recommendations, they had to change those rules. They had to stop building games where you jump up and down because people got sick. Right? But if you go backwards in the old VR research, 20 years ago, one of the four factors for engagement in VR was actually negative engagement, which means if people throw up, they're actually engaged. <laughs> of course, we can't do that when we sell headsets and games. So navigation and wayfinding and allowing people to feel that the, the world is around them is so important. I think there's a term, well, you can use a different term, but immersive literacy, and that is understanding how to navigate and orient, orientate around our environment but also as a game designer or a virtual designer, understanding how other people do it. Does that make sense? So when I taught game design, when I first started, I had the game design students evaluate each other, and they learned probably more from that evaluation than just from designing their own games. Because when you design a game, it's so easy to think, oh, other people will know exactly how to go through it. But that's because you know how to go through it. Does that make sense? So there's a double-sided element to this which I'm still wrestling with. So we could look at games and say, well, why should we teach game design in academic areas? Um, one easy answer is because there's so much money, apparently. Um, but the other answer is, especially for humanities, one starts thinking about how do people interact. And I'm not sure about here, but in the universities I was in, in the humanities areas, 
we're not taught visualization, we're not taught interaction design, we're not taught user experience and evaluation. So if humanities people have all these tools and have all these audiences, maybe the game design is a great way for understanding some of these issues. Sorry, I feel like I'm ranting a bit. Um, in Australia, and I know it's not very applicable, but there was a report just done this year on who plays games, and suddenly people realized almost half are female, 81% of everybody plays video games, but also a huge majority of our families that share, they share the games between the generations. So there's a real opportunity for cultural heritage to actually have layered information where children and adults and grandparents can share information across these different types of games. Uh, another interesting thing about games, particularly for cultural heritage, is how you can use mechanics to teach people things they take for granted. Um, on the left hand side is a game that teaches you through just organizing colored shapes, the, the yellow and the blue, the triangles and the squares, and you have to put them in an order in relationship to the neighbors, but after a while you start realizing that they're discriminating against each other. So I teach a systemic discrimination. On the right hand side was a, is a at least 20 years old game using, it's a mod of Unreal Level, Unreal Tournament I think, um, by designers at RMIT and they won an Australian government grant to build this game of a refugee camp in South Australia, which is hidden away from the city if you like. And I thought it was really interesting because it's not very interactive at all. So you are surrounded by these non-playing characters who walk around like zombies and your mission is to find someone who will help you escape. Now as soon as they got the grant and built the game and it got publicity, the government tried to shut it down and only recently did the game designers say their names. Um, but it's a very powerful effect this game, using non-interactivity to make a point about what happens to people left in this situation. And of course, and I, I think you'll know more of these examples than I will, mm. Um, the ability to work with indigenous companies is, is, is really powerful and never alone is, I think, not just winning BAFTAs and so forth and being spoken indigenous language, but they now own part of the game company. So they could use it to employ their own designers, craftspeople and storytellers, but they can also move into the game industry business. And I've, we're just finishing a, an edited book on Assassin's Creed. And we were talking to historians and archaeologists who wrote this about how they use it in the classroom. But what I had not realized until last year, or the year before we started it, was a number of museums and galleries using Assassin's Creed as well. And um, it's a very elaborate game, perhaps too elaborate for some, but it's got this amazing discovery tool which raises all sorts of interesting questions about how you promote the paradox or research behind it. And it also has a story creator mode, so you can create your own quest using the material of the game. But then there's a the copyright issue. So there's some very interesting things, but Assassin's Creed is actually, Ubisoft, the game company, has also moved into the escape room business with galleries, libraries, and exhibitions. I said I'd briefly mention technology. Um, I've been talking about games, but also games, VR, etc. There's a, a real issue for scholars, and that is that, and these are just a couple of, of headsets that were available in the last five to 10 years, People don't know how to use them, and when you see the presentation in the media, they often don't show you how the audience uses them. So we built a simple poster to describe where you are, how you view it, what the features are, what's the relative cost, and we, we had all these equipment. And at that stage, the HoloLens 1 was probably one of the leading ones, but every so often it didn't work with the game engine. Um, it was superseded within, I'd say, two years. And some of the other headsets here were superseded within one year, or well, they didn't work anymore. Um, so it's a real problem with headsets, it's a real problem with data, but it's also a problem with augmented reality. I, I gave a workshop to Americans who were taught AR software, um, you know, a, a funded workshop, and a year later I came back to see their projects, and they had, um, half of them had taken the software product, an AR product, which had been bought out by a giant company, the software no longer existed, the company no longer existed, but the worst thing was all their data was online because it was cloud, and so they didn't have their data either. So it was a major issue for them, this reusability. And I said this last year, and I'll briefly mention this again. Uh, another problem with the technology and explaining it to people is when we have too many categories. So the original definition of VR was it was a component of a spectrum of mixed reality. And there were four types in this famous paper from about 
30 years ago, including augmented virtuality, which is quite hard to explain to most people. But I guess like, the best example I'd give would be esports. So everything is computer generated, but it takes one thing from the outside world. So it augments virtuality with reality. And the other issue is that when you explain things like AR, most people have an AR app on their phone, which is not AR, because it layers objects on your phone with the real world behind. But that, that augmented object is supposed to be spatially embedded in the, the real world. So given these two major problems, the number of categories that's confusing and the use of categories, which still confuses, people have started talking about X, um, XR as the overall spectrum. But there's one other thing which sometimes gets lost in this discussion. Extended reality also promises to calibrate for every type of headwear, laptop, etc. that you're doing. So as a designer, you don't need to build a software system for each type of hardware. It just knows. It just works it out. That's the dream anyway. But with these creation tools, like on the, on the left is um, Bolt's AR Snapchat, which transforms city spaces into green spaces. And on the right is the latest Apple on your phone, LiDAR, which creates automatic 3D models and then catalogs them for you in space. I won't go for that hard music. Um, you, you're then allowed to put them into this wonderful, shining, peaceful world called the metaverse. And you've also got AI to help you do these things. In this case, this is actually um, the past and letters from 500 years ago, and all this is completely fake, based on reality or historical reality. Um, so it's a really interesting question. That's a very powerful set of photos or paintings, and it's completely AI generated from statistical sampling. Um, so how would you be able to tell the difference? And, and my issue isn't so much that. My issue is perhaps a lot of these products automatically go on the web, and the architects in my school are doing this already, using AI for design for crematoriums to create memories of, of sample users. How will we in the future know what was AI generated from historical data and what was historical data? Um, and then, of course, it will go into this thing, the metaverse. And I think uh, the, the headsets are wonderful. The, the, the use and explanation of use has not been great. But people on Twitter pointed out one thing that I think is very good. They've made the headsets cheaper and more powerful, and they dominate the headset market. Maybe three quarters of the world is, is Quest, owned by Facebook. But they haven't got social sharing yet, which is the problem that destroyed VRML as a format. And, if, and they're talking about using AI in the creation of this as well. But there's a, a paper on, on it as a problem. First is a conversation about AI as an existential threat in terms of allowing us not to make critical judgments. And secondly, the academics have said, this is great. Now we've found that um, the, the normal chat GPT, where you type in queries and it creates movies or images, etc., you don't need that. It's much faster and more efficient for the machine to work out that you're looking and asking new questions. And it said the problem with this might be privacy of data. But I think the problem with this is actually, we stop thinking about things we stopped thinking about how we would ask questions. So there's a privacy issue as well, perhaps, especially with biofeedback and how the latest Quest can track your upper body with the headset, which is wonderful from an interaction design point of view, but there's no real conversation yet on who uses this data and for what. So I just raise these questions, I'm not going to answer them here. And then I'll briefly mention a couple of student projects even at student level, which relate back to what I started with. Um, we initially developed games based on literature, and one was a Chinese game, Journey to the West, which is known in English circles as Monkey, or Monkey Magic. And the, the English version is a BBC voiceover version of a Japanese version of a Chinese story of a monk who goes to India. So it's not completely accurate, right? Um, but the original story is a classic of Chinese literature. And when we built a game on the traditional book, which we had a, a scholar of traditional Mandarin translate it, we found that when we tested the Chinese students, they thought it was wrong because they had the wrong version. So it had been translated through popular culture for so many media and generations, theirs wasn't accurate either. So we had this interesting problem. When you take a literal translation, you might find that the actual popular uh, transference of it doesn't match up. And so a Chinese student came to me, and he was a specialist in calligraphy, and his friend was a master's of traditional Chinese music. 
and he wanted to recreate Taoism, the books of Taoism, through a game. And what we did was, rather than show it directly and tangibly, we wanted to show, because the books themselves are even hard for Chinese people to understand, how it's different to the way people normally see things. And what he did was take a touchscreen game and using your fingers, you actually have to imitate and show empathy to the relationship between, say, the characters and the seasons through the game of Go, through painting, through calligraphy or music. So I won't have time to show, show it, but it was really interesting that when you give indirect feedback and a, a way in which people can watch people performing, how engaged they get. And I also mentioned that mixed reality can show you different viewpoints. This was a case of a, a recreation of a 400-year-old boat that went from the Netherlands through Indonesia to Australia. So this is the replica, a floating replica. And they were running out of money. In fact, that boat in our city had to be moved to the other side of the country in order to save it. We developed a project using two hololenses. So in this boat, the Doifkin, inside are actually cannons and cannonballs and the spices that they took from Indonesia. And we built a, a mixed reality map so if you have these two um, hololenses on, um, you see the, the, the story. I'll go back, actually. Oh, no, actually, I don't have another drawing of it. You see a map appear in front of you. You have to take the spices, and the, the, the hololens will recognize it, and it will allow you to do the story across the world over, over 400 years using the actual physical artifacts. But the important thing is not that. The important thing is with the hololens, the two people can see each other and they can see the physical world, but they both see different things on top. And they don't realize initially. So they have to communicate to share the same picture of the world. So mixed reality can allow you to do this. And it has sound and you can control the 3D objects and move them. Do you mind seeing the sound a little bit? Thank you. But what you can also do is use this in museums with artifacts. And this is a... Do you want me to turn it down here? Ah, oh, thank you. The sound is not really important here. Ah, oh, and here it definitely goes. Basically, the whole lens can actually allow you to move objects and reanimate them. So this is the oldest existing steam engine in the world on a ship that was sunk 100 years ago. And after 30 years, the museum managed to make the steam engine work again. And the artifacts all around this gallery, which is the Shipwrecks Gallery in Perth, Western Australia. And your job is to put the parts together from the museum, and the map will appear, and then the engine will start working. But you can actually ask people to explore the Aboriginal version of it, and it's recorded in rock art, or the European version of it. So you can have these two different overlapping worldviews. Um, five minutes? I gave myself six, but okay. And we also built a virtual museum template to show people how they could build things themselves. And this was designed to be as crude and simple as possible. But very briefly, one wall is of uh, a video of a shipwreck from 400 years ago, the Batavia, another 400 year old ship. Another is images, another is a 3D model, another is a map of the site, which is six hours north of the main city. And if you change the, the times of one wall, one media wall, it changes the other. So you can see gaps between the different types of media of the collection. And there was a simple way of designing a game so you could create virtual quests to lead people through the museum. We also looked at using linked open data and historical journeys to create interactive maps with audio visual and compared them. And we worked out a way of using 3D models on the database of the Wikipedia so you could in real time link 3D models text and images and change them like in a 3D Photoshop. And then the, using the semantic web, you could actually ask questions of all the other models in that database across the web. So I won't have time to go through this one. And we've also run workshops, well, I've run workshops for the last three or four years, working with archives and museums and students to see if they could create simple prototypes which would then lead to future projects for them. I mentioned it in the workshop this morning, but the one on the right was a 2D game where you help a person with amnesia from 500 years ago go around the city and get their memory back. And the one on the left was a QR AR code game where if you have one hour between trains, it links you around the building and you have a quest to find things. And they're able to do these game prototypes within 
a few days. Um, but what I've tried to do is work out simple ways of teaching my students as well. What are the simple elements of a game which allows people to understand and learn beyond just the game itself? On the, on the left hand side is the, the, basically a first year student group uh, creating a, using unreal augmented reality to learn about pollution and cleaning birds. Um, with a UK university, we also work with students in South and uh, Easter Island and the students who are between 8 and 12 years old go to their parents to find out stories in the traditional Polynesian language and then the students in the UK help them build a, a game design around these, these lost and half forgotten words. But we've also looked at building escape rooms and the interesting thing about escape rooms is people create their own memory, they create their own understanding and they work in groups. So I, I think I'm going to run out of time. Do I have two minutes? Yeah. Two minutes. With uh, a group this year, we also built a reverse escape room. And what I thought was really interesting was the students, who are mostly non-digital, developed physical artifacts, which is like a, a quest, which you have to uncover like a detective. And only then and near the end, do you put codes into the digital world and you keep a monster out. So it wasn't historical, but it was a museum. And combining physical and digital in this sense was very successful because people could place themselves along what they were comfortable with. And we also ran a, um, just a few weeks ago, a glam event where we asked people who are specialists in interactive, immersive parks and tourist sites to explain how they use escape rooms and immersion and compare the numbers that visit them with the numbers that use the museums and how they use social media. So I'm going to end now because I've run out of time. We have recently ran a, a PhD project scholarship to find someone who will help us filter AR. It doesn't have to be visual, it could be sound based, so people can limit or constrain their approach to traumatic heritage sites using AR. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.